Psalm 132 is a prayer. It's a prayer to God to remember the promises that he made to David regarding the temple so that the Lord might once again honor uh, that temple as the center of Israel's worship. And we have no doubt about the fact that this psalm was probably written during a time of great difficulty when the temple was either abandoned, possibly even needed to be rebuilt. We don't, we don't know the time frame uh, of this particular psalm. But remember something, Christians. In the Old Testament, the temple in Israel, and specifically in Jerusalem, was the place where God chose to put his presence in a very real and dynamic way. And that's why the Jews were to go to Jerusalem during those feast times and go there to worship, offer sacrifices, and meet with the Lord. And there the high priest would go into the temple once a year to deal with issue of sin for himself and then also the the nation on the Day of Atonement. And many, many things went on at the temple that were very key to the worship of Israel. It signified the center of worship. Now, we have to understand as we go through this psalm that the, the, the dynamics have changed under the new covenant because now you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. God has chosen to put his presence in you. So it's no longer in a building. It's no longer in a city uh, that's part of a nation. Uh, In fact, you are now that holy nation, the Bible says. So things have changed. It it, it is different. But as we go through this psalm, you can kind of, you can see the heart of the psalmist. You can see his cry to the Lord, even though it's not something that we would pray specifically today related to a building, right? Right? Uh, we, might be, we might be praying uh, in a more general sense today for the body of Christ, for God to show his glory through the people of God and so forth, which are now the, the collective temple of the Lord. But this begins this way, verse 1. It says, remember, O Lord, in David's favor, all the hardships he endured, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Now you remember that it was in David's heart to build a temple for the Lord and he even gave his plan to the, the prophet and uh, said, I want to build a temple for the Lord and Nathan said, let it go for it. May it be so. And then later on got a a word from the Lord saying, no, David's not to be the man who builds the temple. He's a man of blood. I'm going to have his son build the temple who will be a man of peace. And so David never got to see the temple uh, being built, but he spent the rest of his life preparing for it. But the psalmist is recalling to the Lord the passion of David to see that temple uh, built and so forth. And it says in verse six, behold, we heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of Yaar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests Be clothed with righteousness and let your saints shout for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of your sons, or rather one of the sons of your body, I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies, that I shall teach them their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. So the promise is uh, given to us again, to David, that the Lord swore to him that one of his sons would always sit on the throne. But of course, there's a farther and longer sort of a prophetic fulfillment of that in the person of Jesus Christ. And as we get to the last 
few verses of this psalm, you'll notice in verse 14 through the end, the whole tenor of this thing changes. This psalm turns prophetic from the standpoint that the, the, the Lord now speaks in these final verses in the first person, and you'll notice he speaks of the coming of Messiah. He says, this is my resting place forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests I will clothe with salvation, and her saints will shout for joy. Verse 17, there I will make a horn to sprout for David. Now, again, that's prophetic and poetic language. Remember, horn always refers to strength. And so he's saying, I will increase David's strength. And he's talking here about the coming of Messiah. Okay? The ultimate strength of David is the Messiah. And so he says, in fact, at the very end of that verse, I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. So this is really a, it's really a beautiful psalm, uh, the, which begins with this, this, this passionate prayer for God to restore his center of worship in Israel, in the temple, reminding him of all that uh, he promised to David. But then the Lord goes on and takes this thing further. In the bottom or the last part of the psalm, the Lord goes on to remind of this greater prophetic picture of the coming of Messiah and how God's plan goes beyond David and even beyond Israel, and how the Lord will bring forth his Messiah.